Now, Christy, I have only seen some very grainy film of you, and it's not often that we have someone on Classic Sports who hasn't been with us for 70 years or so, but I would be very honored if you could show us your, your pitching motion. It was so unique, oh. and we could go through it. Why don't just sure, no step problem. down there sure. and be careful? Well, how do you catch balls with that mid? It's so small. Uh, it's uh, easy. Uh, the, the ball just comes right into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so what's, what's your repertoire? How many pitches do you throw? Well, I probably had uh, anywhere from 30 to 40 variations on, on my pitches. Of course, you have you know, different ways to hold your fastball to make it in-shoot, out-shoot, drop, cut, however you want to go. And you're going to change speeds on your curveballs. Uh, normally, you want to snap and have a nice drop, mm -hmm. have it spinning uh, you know, as hard as you can with all four seams hitting the wind. If you were to look at a clock, you'd have it going from 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock, so you get a nice hard dip down and across from a right-handed batter. But then I also had my fadeaway, which I was shown by a teammate of mine in Honesdale, Davey Williams, who was trying to throw it one day. And what you do is you, you, turn your, you put your hand on the other side of the ball and turn my right arm into a left arm, and you snap it this way. Does so that, that hurt? Uh, you, you really don't want to throw it more than 10 times in a game because, it, yeah, it could kill your arm. But what it gives me is a left-handed curveball. They called it a fadeaway. And wow. it would dip into a right-handed batter away from a left-handed. Right. So just my normal fastball motion, I give it one pump and drive back here, high leg. Hmm. And that's how, how I threw. What a tremendous <clears throat> power when you release the ball. Well, uh, I mean, it's, that's nice of you to say. But... Mm. Uh, I mean, really, uh, you don't make it to the big leagues unless you can get the ball up. Now, I've read about somebody, and now as long as I've got you here, maybe you can tell me exactly what happened. Charlie Faust. <laughs> Charlie Faust, the giant jinx killer, is actually, uh, it was, he was a wonderful fella, and uh, during the season of 1911, it was our last road, or next to last road trip west in the season of 1911, we were staying at the Planters Hotel in St. Louis, and then off the street walked this Kansas farm kid in his best Sunday suit. It didn't even come close to fitting him. And he walked right up to John McGraw and told John McGraw that... Now he's uh, the big boss. Yeah, my manager and great friend, tremendous manager of the New York Giants. And he walked right up to McGraw and said that he had gone to this fortune lady. And uh, she told him he was going to be famous and in all the headlines of the papers. But for $5, she'd give him a full reading. And so he gave her the $5. And then she told him all he had to do to be famous. And in all the headlines of all the newspapers was to pitch for the New York Giants. So all of us who heard this, we're laughing hard. And John McGraw didn't know what to do about it. He's laughing, too, and he's kind of playing around with the kid. And then he said, oh, she also told me if I pitched for you, we will win the pennant. And everyone, you're kidding. What? She did? And so This really happened? It did. So we brought him out, gave him a tryout, had tremendous fun with him, and gave him a uniform, told him to loosen up and sit on our bench, and then we won. And then the next day came out, we won again. But he didn't pitch. Yeah, I did, actually. Uh, once he, he made his way to Boston, we kind of let him go in St. Louis. We went on to Chicago, and somehow he hopped the train and got to Boston and caught up with us again and said, fellas, you can't win without me. Uh, this fortune lady told me this. So we put him on the bench, and the players then, because he had made, he'd never been out of Kansas in his whole life mm -hmm. to get to St. Louis, much less get to Boston. So we paid for his train ticket to bring him into New York. And uh, we had a tremendous homestand, and then on our last road trip west, we decided that uh, we would bring Charlie Faust along with us. And with him along, we won our first 15 games in a row. And one of the games we lost was in St. Louis when some newspaper correspondents with, that were with Song on the trip, they kidnapped Charlie and they stuck him on the St. Louis bench. So we ended up, before we got home then, we won the pennant. Uh, with him on the bench. With him on the bench. And so once we did clinch, the crowd would cheer in every ball game when it got to a late inning for McGraw to put him in the game. And on October 7th, which was three days after we clinched, and two days before Charlie's birthday, Charlie Fout got his chance against last place Boston because our old friends, uh, Turkey Mike Donlin, Al Bridwell, Fred Tenney was manager of the mm -hmm. Braves, and uh, McGraw put him out there to throw. He gave up a double, a sacrifice hit, a sacrifice fly ball, and a ground out. They only scored one run off of him because he didn't have enough stuff to hit. Ah, how about yeah. that for little old Charlie yeah. Fass? It's true after all these years. Now, of all the great things that happened to you, before you go, one last question. Mm -hmm. The proudest moment of your career. Well, I would have to say, I mean, there were so many wonderful moments, and uh, I, most people would expect me, I think, to mention either my first no-hitter in my first full season uh, in the big league. I threw a no-hit, no-run game against St. Louis, or the three shutouts in the 1905 World Series. But honestly... My proudest and most memorable moment in the big league was in the season of 1906. Um, I had joined the club late because I had the diphtheria in the spring. And so I didn't, I, I had a relatively decent season, but the Giants had a pretty bad year. And John T. Brush, our owner, decided to bring my brother Hank 
up to the big leagues, about a year and a half before he mm -hmm. was really ready. And uh, against St. Louis in September, I pitched the first eight innings of a ball game against the St. Louis Ball Club, and I decided to give way, and I asked Mac if he would let Hank finish up. And so Hank pitched the last inning of the ball game, and I only wished that uh, my mother and father and, and my wife had been there because, of course, we didn't know that was going to happen that day. And, and Hank finished up, and, and we, as a brother combination, became, as far as I know, the first and only brother combination to pitch and win a big league ball game. Well, that must have been a thrill. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for this uh, You're welcome. very special visit. If you can, get out of that war thing when it comes along. Okay. And take a few deep breaths for me. How are you breathing? Pretty good. Lungs, <coughs> lungs clear? Lungs are clear. Good. Hope it stays that way. Thanks so much. Don't nice go to, to Saranac you. Lake. Enjoy the sweater. Thank you. That, I get to keep it. Okay. We've been talking with uh, Christy Mathewson here on Classic Sports.